In the pantheon of modern literature, few characters have stuck with us as thoroughly as him, Frankenstein's monster. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive! Stitched together from different parts, he eventually found his voice and grew into something strong and powerful. It's not a bad metaphor for Canadian literature, drawn together from disparate sources, and it too has taken on a life of its own. A big reason why is Margaret Atwood. From surfacing to A Handmaid's Tale, she is one of our most gifted storytellers. In 1966, Margaret wrote a poem, Speeches for Dr. Frankenstein, and ever the forward thinker, she's just released it as an e-book and as an app. She's also celebrating the 40th anniversary of one of her seminal works, Survival. It's a guide to Canadian literature that asks an important question, what is it that makes a Canadian story Canadian? Please welcome back to the program, Margaret Atwood! Good. <laughs> I um, I gotta tell you, I love the fact that you bring your purse on set. It's got my glasses in it, George. Does it? It makes me think you got something else in there that you just can't leave in the back. It's just it's sort of mysterious. That's kind of lovely. Cough drops. Cough drops. <laughs> I was thinking something more nefarious than cough I'm not drops. Not telling about them. Okay, fair enough. Um, <laughs> The reissue of the book is something, but I was curious, when you, when you came out with this book, you were young, you started talking about this stuff, and a lot of people were wondering where you got off. Yeah, well, it split in two. Uh, to the extreme right, we had people saying, how dare you write a, a book of 350 pages about something that doesn't exist. And over on the left, we had, uh, how dare you write a book of 350 pages and not put in more working men's poetry. I looked. <laughs> But in the end, even just the fact that you were young, they just didn't think that you were qualified to have the conversation. Did you feel well, like you were ahead of yourself? No, I didn't. Um, in those days, Canadian literature was not, and it still isn't, um, taught much in university, so that the people who were teaching it felt that they had a special pumpkin patch that was theirs, right. and that other people should not really play with those pumpkins. You know, I haven't gone back into the whole body of Canadian literature to have a look. Uh, as I said, 1972 was probably the last moment when I could have written a book like that. Uh, but a number of the chapters, if you go and look at the end of each chapter and see what I was saying would probably happen next, a number of those things have happened. I said in the nature chapter that we had been in the habit of looking at nature as a monster against which we were powerless, but that was going to turn around. We we're going to start seeing nature as a threatened and fragile thing that we were going to have to help. And that has now happened. Um, the female chap the chapter on women, that, that was just kind of starting in 1972. That whole thing has, has changed a lot. Uh, I said at that time that we had, we had a, books about very young female people and very old female people, but there wasn't much in the middle. Well, that middle has now been filled in. Something that really struck me was this conversation about being lost in Canada, and that this is something that, that we are as a people in a way, that most people don't really know what Canada is, not just geographically. You know, we've, um, this has been a topic for a while, but the rest of the world is now catching up to us. Because if you go to any country in the world, they're having the same debate about their own countries. And what does it mean to be British anymore? Uh, what is it to be French? Has that changed? Um, you, if, no matter where you go, they are now talking that way, whereas they didn't used to, it was only us. What do you think triggers that? Um, I think modernity or post-modernity. I think there's been a lot of people moving around. I think there's been uh, generational turnovers that have uh, shaken old images of what people, who people thought they were what people thought their country was about. But that's happening everywhere. You hear an awful lot about that, this idea. Like Don Cherry was on Twitter the other day, and he went off, and he went off about all these things going on in Toronto. He goes, oh, is this the city we even recognize? And I was like, this is just the city that we have. And this is the country that we have, and maybe we'll never really understand it, and that might be okay. The well, question there's is... a reason that he doesn't recognize it. It's called OLD. <laughs> <laughs> It's the, what the younger people are doing that he doesn't recognize. But, like, and, but this happens to everybody in every generation. And if you go back and look at the Romans, mm -hmm. they were writing about the same thing, young people today. Mm -hmm. But you don't write about that so much. 
Um, you seem to identify as a younger person, not as a Don Cherry. You're younger than he is, but you identify. Yeah. Him? I think you are. I'm Gee, pretty sure you are. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but you don't seem to be caught up in that. You don't seem to be feeling disconnected from um, modernity. No, not particularly. You want to know why not? I don't know. I'm, I think probably because I'm very curious about it. So I uh, dabble in it. I dabble in modernity. What has your dabbling taught you? What's the residue from that? Dabbling? Yeah. Um, well, we can talk about various different technologies. We can talk about people's worries. Uh, people have a lot of worries today that are different from the worries that they used to have. Um, young people have a lot of worries, quite rightly so. Uh, what are zombies really about? We could talk about that. Well, but then you have to figure out are zombies actually the undead, or is it just an infection, some sort of virus? It gets really scary. Okay, today's zombies. Yeah. Today's zombies changed from yesterday's zombies in 1968 mm -hmm. with Night of the Living Dead first sure. version. But the, the pre-1968 zombie was, a, was the Haitian variety of zombie. Mm -hmm. And there was none of this getting infected because they bit you stuff. But the thing to remember about zombies, as distinct from werewolves, Frankenstein monsters, Obviously. and Grendels, mm -hmm. and even Caliban, they're not chatty. <laughs> the, these, zombies, these zombies are not very loquacious. They don't speak much. In fact, they hardly speak at all, because they don't have any brains. Right. And, um, <laughs> and Why are you laughing, one, dude? She's telling the truth. Why are you yes. laughing? <laughs> one zombie is not a threat, because they're just kind of shambly, and they don't have a brain. But right. they always attack in hordes. And no zombie story is ever told from the point of view of the zombie, unlike vampire stories unlike Frankenstein, unlike any other monster you care to name. They don't tell, they're not narrative. Was that because if zombies because don't have brains, they don't have empathy? And if they, they don't, don't have, have language. Right. It, it impedes one when telling a story. <laughs> <laughs> you can't talk. I've seen many a mime be an effective storyteller. Do you, do you get reminded of this when uh, the House of Commons resumes and you watch them all shamble back in? <laughs> do you sit there and go, that's a oh, modern... It's a worry, it's a worry. <laughs> <laughs> what did you bring? What is this? That is the speeches for Dr. Frankenstein, the mad scientist figure uh, that I wrote in not when I was 19, but shortly thereafter, in the early 60s, and that Charles Pachter, who was then about 22, did as, a, wow, as an illustrated silkscreen book, and that House of a Nancy has just turned into an app. So that you can see the whole book, of which there are only 15 copies in the world, uh, of, the, of the paper one. You can see the whole thing now through the wonders of electronic digital media. Which book do you think should be taught in Canadian schools? <laughs> I hate these questions. Uh, which book? We only get one? Yes, one. Only one book yeah. taught in Canadian schools? <laughs> Just one. No, no, well, no, I mean, there can be others, but which is the one that you think should be that maybe isn't right now? You always have a problem with books taught in schools, and here's the problem that you have. Parents don't like it when there's sex in them. Right. And swearing. Right. Kids don't like it when they're boring. So you have a problem. So to kids, the only thing that is not boring, sex and swearing? I'm with if, you so far. If there's, <laughs> <laughs> That's why we usually get 19th century books taught in schools, because the sex and swearing is off stage. Right. It's not that there isn't any. It's that it's not right on the page. They, they use asterisks, or they say, he uttered an oath. <laughs> and as for the sex, they go into the woods and then they come out and she's pregnant. Right. But you don't get to see. See, the longest time I thought pregnant was just code for splinters. I didn't realize <laughs> that she actually was going to have a baby. Okay, well, so I didn't see. know what was going on in there. Nobody told me. <laughs> we didn't discuss it in the classroom. They just assumed you'd figure it out. Well, I did finally, but it took me a while. Okay, so this must don't be... go for buggy rides with men at... At the darkness. <laughs> Pregnant. Many buggy rides offered your way? It's okay in a car, because that's not in Tess of the Durbervilles. Right. <laughs> Literature is actually spoiling our children's minds. So there you're bringing are. up sex and cursing. It must lead to a book. Which book should it be, then? 
Let's have Ellis Monroe. There you go. Why don't we do, for grade 10, why don't we do an anthology of short stories? Mm -hmm. That would probably be a good thing to do. That's a good answer. I like that. Oh, uh, yes. And then you, they're short. Uh, you can choose. You don't have to read them all. And, um, and you get a sampling of what's You can have there. a sampling. And a lot of them don't have sex and swearing in them because they're too short. <laughs> I just want you to know that if it were possible, I would ask you to marry me. <laughs> Margaret and I would everybody well, good be. But you're single. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Surfacing to a handmaid's tale, she is one of our most gifted storytellers. In 1966, Margaret wrote a poem, speeches for Dr. Frankenstein, and ever the forward thinker, she's just released it as an ebook and as an app. She's all hearts. He eventually found his voice and grew into something strong and powerful. It's not a bad metaphor for Canadian literature, drawn together from disparate sources, and it too has taken on a life of its own. A big reason why is Margaret Atwood from- okay, Margaret Atwood! Hi, my good. Hi. Good to see you. I am also celebrating the 40th anniversary of one of her seminal works, Survival. It's a guide to Canadian literature that asks an important question. What is it that makes a Canadian story Canadian? Please welcome back to the In the pantheon of modern literature, few characters have stuck with us as thoroughly as him, Frankenstein's monster. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive. Stitched together from different